Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Senior Director with the Open Education Network. Thank you so much for joining us today so that you can get to know our Manifold Pilot community, specifically the team at Eastern Kentucky University, who you will meet in just a moment. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the Manifold Pilot before handing things over. So a couple years ago, the OEN was selected as one of six organizations to join the Manifold community. We received a grant funded support package thanks to funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And that package included one year of Manifold managed hosting, training and support. Then uh, the OEN provided an additional year of Manifold access so that our, par our pilot participants would have a good amount of time to kind of dig in. Mm -hmm. And so when you add all of that up, we have a two year pilot that is running through March, 2024. And then this group is going to make recommendations as to whether the OEN offers Manifold to the broader community. So traveling back in time, we launched officially in spring 2022. We have people from more than a dozen institutions and organizations, and we all went through the Manifold training together, which was led by Terrence Meyer at the University of Minnesota and Robin Miller at the City University of New York. They are both here and both continue to provide support as needed, and we are very thankful for their guidance. I'm going to drop a link in the chat so that you can see the pilot communities projects in the OEN Manifold instance as they are today. Speaking of today, we're going to hear from Kelly Smith. She is Director of Collections and Discovery at Eastern Kentucky University Libraries. And she is here with Laura Edwards, who is Team Leader of Discovery and Metadata at Eastern Kentucky University Libraries. Laura and Kelly are going to discuss their Manifold Pilot Project, SWK340, Social Work Research Methods, OER Collection. In addition, Terrence and Robin are here, and they can talk about the upcoming uh, version 8 Manifold release and answer any questions you might have about Manifold more broadly. And in addition, some of you here may have experience with Manifold yourselves, so please know you're always welcome to share your experience and feel free to do that as we move through the hour. Also, as questions occur to you, feel free to drop them in chat and we'll just take it as it comes. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Kelly and Laura. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us and listening about this today. Um, so as Karen introduced me, I'm Kelly Smith and I'm gonna make a slight correction. So Laura's title is has changed. She's actually Associate Director for Metadata and Discovery instead of Team Leader. We had a reorganization since I don't know, LinkedIn or wherever that's posted, Laura. Um, so um, we're going to talk today just about our experience over the past year with the OEN Manifold pilot. And um, it has been an experimentation. Um, the things that we're posting in Manifold are not in final status of any kind. It's it's basically us experimenting. Um, so with that, I'll get started. Um, so today we're not going to talk about every feature Manifold does well or everything that we like about it. Um, and we're definitely not going to do a sales pitch, but we want to focus on two specific test cases that we used Manifold for um, and the reason that we wanted to join this pilot. So I'm going to give you just like a little bit of context to start. Um, we are a regional comprehensive university serving a large number of first generation students, um, primarily the Eastern half of the state of Kentucky. Um, we have published faculty authored texts since 2019. Um, we started doing that, as you can see in this screenshot in our um, Encompass digital repository, which is built on the B Press Digital Commons um, platform. So we have published around one book a year. Um, since we started doing this. Um, this is the one, the most, one of the most recent books we've published. Um, this is a first year writing text that was adopted across all sections um, of our first year writing course in fall 2022. So we're super excited about that. So this, this screen, this is a screenshot of um, that the page where we've got that uploaded. And as you can see, and you, most of you might be familiar with, um, with digital commons, it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little static. Um, we don't have a lot of options um, in terms of like the main text that we're publishing. So you can download it as a PDF, as an entire PDF, 
or as um, chapters separated out. Um, so this is not the optimal viewing method for for pedagogical purposes for a textbook. So we had been talking um, about, you know, where to expand, whether to start with press books, you know, what, what our next options might be. And this manifold pilot came up. And so um, we decided to, um, to join. So Laura is going to talk us through these next slides. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what led us to want to try out Manifold? So we've got a couple of highlights of what really attracted us to the Manifold platform. Uh, so first off is um, it's a very beautiful and thoughtful design out of the box. So the, when I first saw a site on a Manifold platform, I don't want to get like too romantic, but I felt like my brain just kind of decompressed when I looked at it because it just made perfect sense. It was just so beautiful. It was so thoughtful. I, yeah, it was just, it was just, I, I was very, very impressed. So just a beautiful, very thoughtful design. Um, as you'll notice, if you start looking at Manifold sites, how this, the, the design is very responsive. Um, there's a lot of white space. So it's very easy to scan and look at the text and collections on the Manifold platform. Next slide, please. Uh, it's a very flexible platform. So in addition to the you know, traditional text-based books like textbooks, it's also really good at supporting, um, like kind of collecting materials and resources around like essential text. Uh, so for example, like you're, if you're a faculty member that's got it, you're using a textbook, but you've also got uh, supporting materials or, um, you know, classroom exercise and stuff that you want to kind of put together around that textbook that you're using. Manifold is a really good place for that. Uh, you can also just create, you know, collections of all, all different kinds of things. Um, it's also really good at supporting uh, multimedia objects like videos, images. And again, it presents all of that in just that very beautiful and thoughtful way that really just kind of makes sense when you end up on a Manifold site. Next slide, next slide please. Uh, so like what Kelly was mentioning earlier is, you know, it's got some really good pedagogical features. Uh, it's <clears throat> so uh, there's like the look and feel like a textbook. I do want to note that and I, I believe Robin and Terrence will talk about this later on. But it does not currently offer text editor support. So the formatting that you're seeing on this screenshot there under that textbook look and feel is like the document was formatted and a source file that was then ingested onto the Manifold platform. But as you can see, Manifold supports that formatting and it renders it in that really beautiful way that's just like, you know, again, just very easy to read and access. And it also supports shared annotation. So you can, um, you can annotate, highlight, notes for yourself. You can also be part of a reading group, let's say like with a class where you want to, you know, do shared annotation. You can also do public annotation as well, which Kelly and I are going to touch base on further down this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they've also got some very good accessibility and usability features on the Manifold platform. Um, there's another thing that really impressed me about this site when I first saw it was the, uh, the support for like the e-reader functionality. So you do have some control over how you, how the text renders on your screen. So you can adjust the size of the text. You can adjust the type of text, like whether you want it to be a serif or sans serif font. Um, you can, you know, expand or, you know, minimize the screen, like however you want. There's a lot of flexibility with that. Correct. The user can adjust it to their own specification. There's also accessibility support. So I pulled out an example here of how they, I mean, they've got this feature built in where you can right there within the Manifold backend add alt text for images that you might upload into a collection. And so on that screenshot there, you can see, um, so there's a screenshot for the Manifold backend where you can add the alt text. And then down towards the bottom is that same alt text, how it renders, so like that's an image that we have added into a collection. And so that alt text transfers over. So it's accessible for screen readers that might be accessing that site. Next slide, please. Uh, this, it has a very intuitive administrative interface. Now the platform, I will say it is very complex and complicated, but it's also very intuitive. Uh, the backend, kind of guides you 
through the process. So when you're going in there to create a text or a collection, you kind of get a sense of what what to do. Like it really does kind of guide you through that process. Um, and it also, this is really great. Like I'm just, this just amazes me that, that we can do this now. Uh, it has drag and drop functionality. So you can drag and drop features around in that back end. That just, that just really makes me really excited. Uh, next slide, please. I also, it's very, it's flexibility with guardrails. I don't know a better way to put it. You have a lot of flexibility, but it's like, it's like you're in a playground, but you're within a very con confined space. They, their design was very thoughtful in how you're constrained with what you can do, but they, the design is thoughtful in that they've already kind of anticipated what you will need to do on that side there. So they have a lot of flexibility in the kind of content that you can add. Um, you have flexibility in that you can add table of contents, resources, metadata, you can add customized um, text that you might want to put on that collection landing page. You can drag and drop those different content blocks around. So again, it's flexible, but it does kind of have that guardrail. So you're not like, gonna, you're not going to break something when you're in the back end. Okay. Next slide, please. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about the test cases and observations. And Kelly, back to you. I'm going to talk about the easy one because Laura's better at the hard ones. <laughs> Laura, Laura's specialty, so just a little context. Um, I am the head of the division, so I have a lot of different responsibilities. Um, Laura's focus is really metadata in the weeds, nitty gritty. So she understands this way more than I do, but um, I'm here too. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about this. Uh, so our first test case was a faculty member who really, really did want to publish her text. She had adopted a textbook that was already in existence, um, one of the good social work textbooks that's out there. And um, but she wanted to include her ancillaries with it for her students um, in an open way instead of having it siloed um, in Blackboard. We had already published her stuff in the BPress repository. And so um, the link, and I can put these links in the chat later, but. Um, you, you can link and, and look and see how that looks because we've, we've still got that in there. Uh, but then we pulled it straight into Manifold just to see how it would look. And correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, but you did not really make any changes. This is out of the box. We threw all correct. that stuff in there and it just looks better <laughs> already. Like, you know, and we have the capability of putting those ancillaries in a coordinated way. If you go to the BPress Digital Commons site, we've got all the ancillaries down there, but they're not um, organized in any way. It's just one after the other, and you just keep scrolling until you find what you're looking for, I guess. Um, but the Manifold one has different collections in the bottom. So it's got the PowerPoints in one and the assignments and whatever, all the things that um, the Dr. Stevenson has in there. Um, okay. And Laura. So that test case worked really well. Our faculty member was super pleased. She loves it. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so the, this test case too, this is where we were experimenting with kind of how could we do open peer review and manifold. So this is for another social work faculty who was interested in authoring her own textbook and was very interested in exploring how could I do open peer review on this. So like as I'm writing like draft chapters, can I put them up on Manifold and then open it up so that I can get comments, not just from my students, but from faculty at other institutions like nationwide for, you know, just, you know, open it all up. So um, she also was like, you know, obviously we, we would want to indicate that this text was in draft mode of this is still a work in progress. So Manifold, there are ways to do that. So on those screenshots there, there's just different ways that I've kind of tried to indicate that there's like, um, I said this in our draft chapters. I was able to customize text to make that more clear. That this is all in draft mode. And then the other interesting thing about Manifold too is that um, when you go into a draft chapter, this is something I'm sure Terrence or Rob, Robin could explain how this is done in the back end. But um, you can indicate that that chapter is in draft mode and it's like it's very prominent. So like in that screenshot there is that yellow bar across the bottom where it says, I modified that to say, you know, draft chapters, just so it's just very clear to the user if they've ended up on that page, this is still in draft mode. So that's, that part was wonderful. Um, next slide, please. 
And so, um, again, so the, like I mentioned earlier, Manifold does support public annotation. That feature is pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. I think the platform does default to allowing public annotation. You do have the option to disable that in the back end if you wish. Um, but we obviously we we left that feature enabled and the annotation features are is pretty streamlined they're pretty easy to see that that function is very easy to access on that manifold platform and it also um show it will display those annotations within the context like if somebody highlighted text and annotated that that annotation will show up side by side with what they've highlighted in the text okay next slide please um so we were kind of just kind of, you know, again, just kind of thinking through like, how do we incentivize people to come to this faculty member's uh, textbook in draft? And so we're like, how would this, if somebody didn't know, and we, and it's like this faculty's like, hey, I'm at a social work conference, come, you know, come annotate this text. This, this is the name of it. Here's the link to it. How would they know where to go? So there is, we, what we noticed that there's not actually a way like if you link directly to that reading group, like the public reading group that we created for this text, there's no way to actually join the group when you end up on the landing page for that reading group. You actually have to back up and go to um, the, uh, the, the full list of public reading groups. So like this text is hosted on OEN's manifold platform. So you have to back up to the, Manifold OEN like homepage for public reading groups and then find the public reading group from that list and then click the join button there. So that's just like a little bit of kind of, you know, additional instructions that you would have to give to users that might want to participate in this open peer review. Next slide, please. Uh, another thing that we did notice was um, when you first go to Manifold and you go to start annotating text, it does kind of default to your own private notes. You have to take the extra step of like identifying what public, like what reading group you want your notes to be part of. And so this is just some screenshots illustrating how you just have to, the user would have to understand that their note is currently is default to their own personal notes and they would have to actively identify the public reading group that they wanted their annotations to be part of. Next slide, please. Uh, another thing we noted was that, um, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna try to explain this correctly. The public annotations are viewable. If it, like you have that text open and you're scanning the text, you have to like kind of scan through the text to see what's been highlighted and made note of. The reason why, I'm bringing that up is so say I'm the faculty member, I'm ready to start revising that draft chapter. I need a list of all of those annotation and notes in like a centralized place. And so that's why I was talking about public reading group. That's like really the only way to do that that we could see. You can't, what if you have it just set to open like public annotations without a reading group, Everybody can see that there are notes and highlights on that, but those highlights and annotations are not collected in a centralized list that that faculty member could access, if that makes sense. They have to be part of a public reading group in order to have access to those notes. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And so, um, uh, to compare this with a another annotation software that we are aware of is called Hypothesis. Um, this is a, and Kelly can jump in, I, if I'm not explaining it correctly, it's a platform agnostic open annotation tool. It's not tied to a platform. So like the annotation tools that I was talking about earlier on Manifold, those are specific to that Manifold platform. You have to be on Manifold in order to make those annotations. Hypothesis, on the other hand, is platform agnostic. Uh, in this screenshot here, this is an example of a plugin that you can enable on the Pressbooks platform, which is a, a separate um, OER authoring platform is kind of similar to Manifold, where you can author o OER text. So this is an example of how you can enable hypothesis as a plugin on that Pressbooks text. Um, it's just integrated better. Uh, 
you don't have to be part of a public reading group in order to see like it just displays in a in that panel on the right a list of all the annotations that have been made on the text that you're looking at so it, you don't and those don't have to be made as part of like a public reading group like that faculty member could just go into this press books instance they could see all a list of all those annotations just right there side by side with the text um and then another thing I did want to note about hypothesis that I thought was interesting is that it's very granular. It does give you control over exactly where you want to enable annotations. So a potential use case might be that you know, if the, a particular draft, the faculty member is ready to go back and revise it, they might want to disable annotations because they don't want additional notes coming in because that text is in the middle of being revised, you can go in into this hypothesis plugin and you can pick, do you want to allow it on chapters? Do you want to allow it on the front matter? You want to disable that or not? You do have a little bit more granularity um, how you can set that up. Okay, so just, just to wrap this part up a little bit, a few um, reflections on the test cases we had is that it, it worked very well for Dr. Stevenson adopted book and ancillaries model. Um, the annotation issues are not a deal breaker for us for adding Manifold. Uh, so we're part of Manifold Pilot, but we also decided to get our own instance of Manifold because we think uh, for the potential that it has for multimedia, it's, it, there are some projects that we really want to publish in there. Um, so it's not a deal breaker for us, but it's definitely worth considering what's best for individual faculty needs, depending on the project. And at this point, um, at the way the annotations are developed, we're probably going to recommend that our faculty member looks more at um, press books because uh, we've got that now too. So for the for the public annotations that she wants to do. Um, and then the third kind of observation is that it, there's kind of a steepish technical learning curve. Um, so um, at least in our institution, um, putting things in here requires mediation by Laura. Um, we have to make it easy for our faculty, otherwise they won't use it. I know that Robin has an extremely robust program at her institution and she could talk a little bit more about how she's managed to do that. But um, for us, just getting started, um, this is definitely something that we that we mediate. Um, and the flexibility, but the flexibility of the platform is a plus, obviously. Okay, just a couple more slides. Um, so, Laura, did you want to talk about, some of these are yours and some of them are mine, so do you want to just take turns? I uh, sure I am right now I will be honest I'm trying to remember what <laughs> the issue that we had with ingesting images and formatting I feel like that might have been something that I had com communicated with Terrence about before and then he fixed the issue for okay. us I believe. so I think full it was disclosure yeah full disclosure we adapted this presentation from one we did like way back in the spring um just for the manifold pilot folks um, and this slide is kind of from that. And so we can't remember exactly what we were talking about. But in the beginning, we had some issues with that. Terrence, I don't know if you want to say anything, but. <laughs> I I don't remember. <laughs> Specifically, I, I, I remember generally being asked the question, but the specifics of it have eluded me. Maybe it was if the alt text was included, because that was the question that um, I think Anne-Marie had in the chat when you ingest images that have alt text, does that carry through? It does. So if you ingest it, if you ingest a text from uh, Google Docs or from Word, as long as you use one of our applications, alt text adding tool, that'll persist into Manifold. Okay. Um, then as we mentioned, the no authorship tools is a little bit of a downside for us in terms of um, offering unmediated um, work. Um, for us, I mean, this is this is applicable to any work we do. So this is just manifold, but you know, there's a lot of project management and time constraints. Um, and so that's that's why, you know, we're definitely looking at this as a pilot project. We're kind of playing around. Um, so I'm I'm just saying this because when you go and look at we haven't done anything really to the look and feel of our pages. Um, that's pretty much out of the box. So 
just put that out there. Um, if you look at other manifold, mature manifold sites, you will see that they all have a very different look and feel and really customized. So um, that's a possibility. Um, we've been struggling with uh, processes for peer review just in general, which is why we were trying to figure out this open peer review thing. Um, and then we are also now starting to explore um, how different it is to have the OAN hosted manifold where we have to, we're, we don't have the ultimate admin rights like people at OEN do. So um, we're not exactly sure what we don't see and what we do see, um, but we're, we're just starting to explore that. So we're not quite sure yet the differences between, between those two things. Um, and then recent opportunities. Um, this is not specific to Manifold. I just wanted to mention this because it was really cool. Um, we had a speaker on campus um, that wasn't talking about OER. She was just talking about student faculty pedagogical partnerships in general. And um, you, it, you guys should click that link and go check that out. Um, she really inspired a lot of faculty to think about this. And um, the faculty that I knew that were that already knew about OER, um, it kind of reinforced to them um, the whole student co-creation co thing. So um, the the social work, the social welfare policy book that um, that our faculty member is working on is is going to include some student stuff as she develops that. So we're really excited about that. Um, the second really big opportunity I just wanted to mention um, is Affordable Learning Kentucky is kind of like our um, Affordable Learning Georgia. It's it's a statewide kind of consortium that's working um, on expanding open in Kentucky. Um, we just submitted a um, IMLS grant, the, fo the focus of which is to develop um, a sustainable, easily adoptable and scalable open source platform to conduct peer re review processes for OER. So stay tuned. <laughs> we might be making a, a solution for, um, for something that, uh, that could be used for peer review. Um, and then another opportunity for us is adding press books to the mix. And um, I just shared this for folks out there who are comparing sites. Um, University of Washington has a really good comparison between press books and Manifold. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Kelly and Laura, so much. And thanks for the conversation in the chat and um, all of the helpful links. I think it's worth highlighting, you know, Jonathan was really trying to get at like, what is the essence of Manifold? Like, are we writing and creating in there? Are we importing and publishing from there? And so um, Terrence and or Robin, I just invite you to expand a little bit on what's coming in the fall, what's possible now. Terrence, you said it really succinctly in the chat, but <laughs> please say more. Oh. Yeah, no, I can I can speak a little bit to what's coming in the fall. So version eight, um, we are expecting to come out, I want to say September, um, possibly August, but I'm thinking September is 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 the more likely of the uh of the two. But so what's coming with that version, we're gonna have GDPR compliance. So there's gonna be more privacy settings that we don't currently have, those will be available uh in the system. Then we're adding the ability to delete your account, which for whatever reason we have some oversight on, but if you want to, that'll be now possible. Um, there'll be a feature that'll allow uh, users to have, their, it's called pending entitlements, but basically what it allows you to do is to invite a group of people in mass to access restricted projects. So if, if you have a project that's restricted for whatever reason, you can invite people via CSV sheet to have access to that. So that's something new. Um, we're going to use that at Minnesota for our journals that have our society related and who would normally get a gratis copy that aren't already OA. So that would be a, our use case at the press, but there's a host of other ways that you could put that to good use. Um, but the big thing that everybody's excited for is text editing. Um, and I can share my screen and I can show you a little of what that will look like. But, but bear in mind, this is on our testing cutting edge instance. So we might see some, some rough spots. Um, so let me share. Oh, and I was gonna say one thing, you were absolutely right about the public annotations. You can't group those in a list when you're trying to you know access them from this notepad, just a point of clarity. But if you are, if your users are um, 
working in the context of a reading group, you can see who's associated with each annotation and jump directly to them if you have them in a reading group. But if there is public, you can't see that because it could be a little overwhelming the other way. So there's that. All right. So let's see. Here is a project in our cutting edge instance. This is Frankenstein. If I dive into this a little bit more, it's going to look pretty similar to what you already see. But the two new things you'll notice are sections and table of contents over here on the side. And if you click into sections, you will see basically the spine of the of the text that you're looking at. So in this case, it's all the various different chapters that are a part of this book. And you can select if you whichever one you want to be the starting point. So you, you'll notice this like when you open an ebook reader, sometimes it starts in the cover, sometimes it starts in the TOC, sometimes it's chapter one. Here you can just click the button and make whatever section start. But the more exciting part is you can click to edit it. And this will be your new view. It opens up this space. It shows as a rich text editor. If you want to, you can also adjust the HTML. So you've got a code editor as well. You can work directly in this interface and make changes. So if you are, say you've ingested a text and you realize, oh no, I spelled someone's name wrong or I put in the wrong date, you can easily now go in here and just fix it directly in the space and not have to go back to that source document and re-ingest it. The other big thing about this is that you can add new sections. So you can maybe get a public domain book and then you want to add a new section to it as a new chapter. You can easily do that. So if you've got a student project and you want to add a new preface or some new uh, apparatus around that, you just add a new section. And this, if we all remember from the Manifold training where we had that YAML project where we would kind of synthesize the text from numerous sources, this basically removes that from the equation. That's still possible. We're not going to get rid of that functionality, but you don't have to worry about a YAML file anymore. It's all going to happen directly in the back end. So you can build the text either by adding as a section uh, something, you, a document you've already got on your desktop, or you can author it directly into the system. And so that's the big, the big feature that's coming with this. And along with this, this will also support MathML. So if you have complex equations, you can now write them in MathML and have them render and be annotated in the reader appropriately. So those are the those are the big features coming up in version eight. And like I said, we're hoping for hoping for September. You can also use those fun drag bars and drag and drop and reorder sections too, which yep. is pretty cool. So if you're like, oh, wrong order, really easy to just grab and move those around, which is pretty nice. Woohoo! I just had to verbalize that because <laughs> for those of us in the Manifold pilot group, it was, and I'm sure across the Manifold community, this was, you know, a, a long, long held dream. So this could be a very simplified workflow to be able to write and publish um, within that one tool. Right. And especially for folks who are trying to use, who want to bake in line various, you know, elements, you know, if you've got like a visualization or you've got like a triple IF sort of element that you don't want to have as a resource. I mean, you can do it as a resource and that's great, but if you want to have it in line with the text, now you can just edit the text and take the code you get from whatever site, copy and paste it from there and paste it in the HTML and you're done. So even if you are working with Word files natively, you can now do that. Okay, while all of you are thinking of any questions you might have, I'm just going to go back to chat. Um, Laura, I think this is while you were talking about some of the differences between annotating in Manifold and annotating using Hypothesis. And Tracy asked, when using plugins, have you had any problems with third-party technologies failing? And if so, how you handled that? Tracy, I'll say that I think Hypothesis is used fairly regularly in the open community, and I don't hear many complaints. Um, has, has anyone here had issues with that? It's basically built into Pressbooks, right? Yeah, and just to back up with Karen said, I've not heard of any issues with the plugin not working on like the, the Pressbook platform or anywhere else. Thanks. And, and if I misunderstood the question, please let me know. Um, one of the other things uh, that Kelly and Laura talked about was, you know, that it's it's a little bit of a 
technical lift and that faculty typically need support if they're going to be working in manifold. And so, um, Robin, can you talk a little bit about how you do that at CUNY and what's been successful for you because you have such a robust program and faculty are in there, they're using it, they're doing it. Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, so for those who don't know me and know I, so I am from the City University of New York and I am based in one of the 25 campuses um, that make up the City University of New York, but I support all 25 campuses. So as everyone has mentioned, I have, I have a very large group of people that work. Our instance is open to everyone affiliated with CUNY. So that's students, that's administrators, that's staff, that's professors, that's everybody. If you have some sort of affiliation with CUNY and you want to make a project, um, you just reach out to me and we make it happen. Um, we do let folks come in very differently from the way that Terrence does it is we give people project creator rights to just jump in there and start going. We currently have 690 projects on our instance, um, over 3,000 texts, um, over 85,000 annotations. Um, our stuff is used by people all over the world because our instance is open. Um, we don't know who's using it because we don't track anybody and we don't have that kind of capability to you know, pinpoint IP addresses or anything like that. But we know it's used because occasionally I get um, folks from some random place in the world asking me questions about a particular thing that they're teaching in their school. And so it's really great to see that we've created um, these truly open resources that are being used globally, which is really exciting for us. That's what we always wanted. Now, to support all of this, because I am the only full-time person at CUNY um, who works on Manifold, uh, much like Terrence is the only full-time person that works on Manifold on the University of Minnesota Press, um, we have a lot to juggle. Um, for me, the most important thing has been to leverage relationships with the library. I'm a, a former OER librarian, I still consider myself a librarian. So I have a lot of connections and it's really important to build those because there's no way I could support um, all of the people that wanna use Manifold on my own. Um, I do do a lot of training. Um, I do training on site. So I was just out a few days ago, at one of our campuses doing some training. So building up those kind of train the trainer sessions too are really important. Getting the folks who might be your first line of defense for questions is really important. Um, so if you, for us, it tends to be um, the teaching and learning centers or the libraries. Those are the ones that generally support any of the digital um, platforms. Um, that we have at the at CUNY. So really getting in there with those folks, getting them trained up, even just basics, so they can ask basic questions. Um, and then organizing a regular, like every semester, um, between semesters coming in and doing a workshop, just a basic intro, showing people what you can do, showing them different models. Um, and then also connecting people. I think that's the most important thing, much like this beautiful community we have here. Um, getting those communities together so that people feel comfortable so that they can ask questions. Um, everyone I've, I've ever worked with here at CUNY is always open to answer questions. And I may have even put people in this group in touch with other folks um, because we tell people this all the time. If you see a Manifold project somewhere in the world on some Manifold instance, um, and you're like, I wanna do that. That's a great place for Terrence and I to start helping you. If you say, hey, I saw this cool thing. How did they do that? And so then we can kind of help you and then put you in touch with those people. So I think a lot of this um, can, the, the lift can be a lot lighter when you've got a little support there, when you know you can reach out to somebody um, and know that you can't break Manifold. We've never had anyone break it. Um, so you just get in there and, and play around. And I think the, the most intimidating factor because it is such a powerful platform, because it is a professional platform, um, can be intimidating and overwhelming for people. But just know that there's so much to Manifold, but you don't have to use it in your first product. You know, you don't, don't feel like you have to do every single thing. You have to have a million calls to action buttons, or you have to have every single content block. It's easy to see all of that and go, oh my gosh, this is too, I, I, I don't need all of this or I don't want it. It's just all there for you if you need it. And, you know, we have simple projects that are just an ebook 
and they're that, they're the hero block only, you know, not a single other content block, not a single resource. Um, and a couple of those books are the most popular books that we have on our instance that are used just all the time because people read them and they have a reading group and they use them in the classrooms. Um, you know, some manifold projects are just audio. They have no text whatsoever. So there's lots of space to get creative um, when people come in and say, oh, I've got this idea. Um, can I, you know, talk to you about these kind of thing? Is this a good platform for me? So I think, once again, just always going back to those relationships and getting people to understand what Manifold is. Um, and hopefully, Jonathan, we've helped you understand what Manifold is. Um, but also, um, you know, all those relationships within your campus of people that might be able to answer some questions. Um, definitely keeping a list of folks who've created projects. Um, and then even people who've struggled, you know, so that people can talk to everyone and, and kind of hear about where um, where things have been tough for them, and then maybe that can help the next person. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. There's been a lot of chat in the chat, and I wanted to highlight, I think it was Anne Marie who was, um, you know, talking about what's going to happen after the pilot and what it's like having your own instance at uh, your institution. And I wanted to um, just sort of come back around to the pilot group's role will be to recommend whether the OEN may continue to offer Manifold. And so Anne-Marie mentioned that um, at her institution, this is the one publishing tool they currently have. And so we really have um, the diversity of OEN membership in mind in terms of wanting to offer infrastructure, wanting to offer tools so that more people can publish even if there are fewer resources at that institution. And so it's very possible that we will continue to have this OEN Manifold community um, well into 2024. And one of the reasons why we're sharing these case study sessions and the progress that we're making as a group is to offer you, the broader OEN community, the chance to kind of think and evaluate about, or um, think about and evaluate uh, whether Manifold might be useful to you at your institution and whether if there were an instance uh, for the OEN community if you think that you would make use of it. So um, that is one of the goals of, of this session and others coming up like it. So just wanted to highlight that and to keep it in mind if you have any feedback about, gosh, that would be really helpful for us. Um, you know, we can't afford these tools on our own or, you know, resources are dwindling. Um, that's the kind of thing that we want to hear from you so we can try and problem solve. Um, Jonathan asked if Manifold code is open source. Indeed it is, and Terrence put the GitHub link there. Liz, you asked if OTL includes Manifold projects, and I'm racking my brain. I feel like surely in the 1,200 or so books, there are probably some that point to Manifold, um, and I think I can do a back-end report to figure that out, but off the top of my head, I can't think of an example. If there's anything you're, you know, if, if there's more to that question that you want to know, let me know and I can maybe provide more um, answers. I see you there. Yeah, not really. I just, um, I was thinking that if I was doing a workshop and one of my folks was struggling trying to find something in the textbook library to review, if I could suggest one to be added, if I found one on somebody else's site. So I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, sure. Kelly's looking for one now. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Other questions for one another or comments or things you might want to see since we're here together and we have a few more minutes. Also, I'll jump in and just offer um, a, any of the documentation that we built up, including our quick guides and things at CUNY. If you'd like to make those available to folks, feel free to point them to our instance, or if not, um, I can certainly give you access to the Google Docs that were used to make them. If you want, I think I made this promise to the other group once, Karen, didn't I? And oh, I'm not sure if I put the links in there, but all of that stuff is open and, and open for you to take what we've done. It's openly licensed. And then, you know, you want to put your own branding in there. 
um, feel free to take those. So that might actually get you moving forward, being able to support people to have your own kind of customized how to do this on manifold guides. Um, but you don't have to start from the very beginning. Don't please don't reinvent the wheel. Thanks, Robin. Oh, oh hi. Go ahead, go ahead yeah. Jamie. Yeah, I was going to ask a quick question, actually. I don't think this is a listserv that Robin and Terrence are on, but there was a question that came in, I think, earlier today um, about Manifold. And so this is the perfect opportunity to ask since we have you both here. Uh, but the question was whether Manifold is compatible with Canvas in terms of being able to import your book into Canvas, I guess, from Manifold to Canvas. They were comparing it to a process that Pressbooks has where you can import into Canvas from Pressbooks. And it's not something I had ever thought about with Man Manifold or have um, looked at any of the documentation. So I don't know if Robin or Terrence, you know, off the top of your head. Yeah, or import into any LMS. But um, this one was specific specifically asking about Canvas. There is no direct pipeline programmatically from Manifold into any of those systems currently. Though anything that you bring into Manifold can, any text that you create in Manifold or bring into it can be exported out as an EPUB 3. So at a project level, you can export that content and potentially just crosswalk it over to any of those. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking as well, because I know we've experimented with exporting the full project, but I hadn't thought about the ingestion into an LMS. So um, that's very helpful. Thank you both. And I vaguely remember during our pilot when we were having those monthly meetings um, talking about H5P functionality, and I can't remember the what came out of that, but I remember having those conversations. Yeah, H5P can be yeah. added either as an interactive resource or it can be baked in line into HTML and Markdown documents or EPUBs. And now with the code editor, you can bake it into basically anything. Okay, hey, thank you both. And Anne-Marie, yeah, that is a good question. I'm so glad Jamie remembered to ask that. Um, it's the Google group, come to life. Um, before we adjourn, I would really love to take the quick temperature of this group. So after our time together, can you imagine using Manifold at your institution? Just like at first blush, does this sound like something that can meet your needs, that you would jump in if it was available to you uh, through the OEN, say, for example. Um, if you could just put a Y or N in the chat, no one's going to hold you to it. Um, but I don't want to lose the opportunity to um, kind of get a sense of, of things. Oh, four exclamation points. <laughs> I won't read too much into lowercase or uppercase Y, so don't worry about capitalization. It's, re it's really helpful. And no one wants to fill out another Google form right now, right? So we can just do it in Zoom chat. Okay, well, as you consider this, um, I will start our farewells and our thank yous. Um, thank you, Kelly and Laura, for sharing your experience with us and for joining our pilot group in the first place. Same goes to our other pilot group members here. Um, it's so valuable to learn from you and hear about your case studies and just get a sense of what you need to do and how you're trying to do it and how it's going. So thank you. And Robin and Terrence, uh, as always, thank you so much for your very supportive and generous help. It's made such a difference as we travel these uncharted waters together. And thanks everyone for coming to learn about Manifold and um, engaging with the OEN community. Hope to have uh, another session or two of these case studies in the future and hope to see you then. And until then, best wishes. Thanks everybody. Farewell.